This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, April 22nd, 2024. Enjoy. Case file number 1577, written by Involtus Solis. A surreal encounter in sunlight and silence. This happened a long time ago, but is no less freaky. I can remember every detail to this day. My dad used to play in bands by night and watch me by day while my mom worked. Therefore, he was often tired during the day, so he'd take me to the playground and sleep on the bench while I played. This happened on a perfectly clear, warm, sunny day. My dad took me to the park and passed out as usual. I was about three or four years old at the time. If you played on an American playground in the late 80s, you'll know this piece of equipment. It's basically a vertical tube shaped like an old telephone handset that's used to climb from one level of the playground gear to another. I remember climbing inside from the bottom, but when I came out of the top, instead of being outdoors, I was inside a small, confined area, about four feet square, which was the same plastic material as a playground equipment. I also seem to remember after crawling into it, the way I came in disappeared behind me. The front of this small area then opened into a tranquil house. I remember crawling into a room with beige carpet, blue gingham curtains, dark wooden trim on the walls, and a picture window sitting area window box with a bunch of stuffed animals in it. Sunlight was coming in through the window and I could see the blue sky. I looked to my left and I could see a kitchen, to my right a living room. I looked around and saw an intercom on a wall only a foot off the floor, next to the plastic playground equipment entrance. I crawled over to it and pushed the button. A male voice said something to me, but I can't for the life of me remember what it was. After being there for a few minutes, I was told by the voice on the intercom to crawl back into the playground equipment entrance. When I did, I was able to crawl back down through the tube and back into the playground, where I found my dad still sleeping on the bench. So what the hell was this? This wasn't anything like anything I've ever seen in my life. This wasn't just a couple of small items being displaced. I completely moved to a different location for an unknown reason. My best theory is that I may have passed out inside the tube and had a quick dream. That's what I've always told myself. However, I remember having dreams from back then, and I remember that this didn't seem like a dream at all. There was no sleep. I remember being lucid the entire time. I'm about ready to file it under the I don't know, therefore aliens category. Unless anyone has a better theory. Hey, did you know that I have a Patreon? You can toss me a dollar a month just to help feed my ravenous hunger. Gotta eat those donuts and pastries, come on. <laughs> or $5 a month if you want access to my horror narrations, you can also join on the channel, and $10 a month if you want access to my uncut reactions for various shows that I'm reacting to first time. I have House of the Dragon, the first season, and also currently reacting to Gravity Falls. If that interests you, head on over. There's a free 7-day trial. You can check it out, see if you like it. Case file number 1578, written by Brings the Dawn. The car that merged from thin air. Back in college, I was one of the few freshmen with a car, so friends often asked me to drive. This was especially true when it came to end of year and people needed to fly back home. They'd ask me if I could drive them to the airport, I'd say yes, and they'd usually pay for gas or buy me dinner as thanks. So I'm driving one of these friends to the airport, via freeway, when we get to telling some stories. This friend, we'll call him Josh, was a regular comedian. One of those Jim Carrey types who put his whole body into the gig. This will come into play shortly. We're driving along, exchanging stories, when it's Josh's turn. He gets into the act, gesturing wildly, when I realize I need to get over to the slow lane so I can take the exit to the airport. I check the rear view mirror and passenger mirror to make sure no one's coming and the coast is clear. There's no cars around us for a good quarter mile in either direction. But I guess I was checking the mirrors too obviously, because Josh decides to stick his head out of the window as a joke. I'm talking everything neck up. Josh looks back down the freeway behind us, sees nothing, and angles his head to look at me, while still out of the window, and says, You're good to go. So I start merging over and a car slams on the horn as I almost hit them while merging to the slow lane. I veer back into my original lane, a little shaken from how I almost hit a car that I didn't see, and turn my body to look behind me, where the car I almost hit flashes its lights at me a few times, from the slow lane, in what I assumed to be anger. I look back at Josh, who's now rubbing his head from where he hit himself on the top of the door, having banged the side of his head when I swerved. Where did that car come from? I asked, confused. 
I hadn't seen anything in my mirrors and Josh had literally stuck his head out of the window and saw nothing, so there were no blind spots this car could have come from. I have no idea, Josh said and I could tell from the confusion on his face that for once he wasn't kidding. We looked at each other, uncertain what had just happened, and again made to change lanes, this time much more cautiously. I very pointedly looked behind me and explicitly asked Josh to stick his head out of the window again to check whatever the blind spot I had missed. So we didn't, almost, hit that car again. Except, there was no car behind us anymore. Nor any cars at all for that matter. There were no cars for a quarter mile in either direction. And we hadn't passed any exits, merges, or other off-ramps. Carefully, I creeped us over the line, to the slow lane. And this time we made it without incident. Josh stared blankly behind us, out the rear window, again seeing nothing. Stared at me and then turned back to stare ahead as we drove the last mile to the airport off-ramp. It really was as if a car had teleported in, blocked our way, and then teleported out. I've never seen anything like it since. Case file number 1579, written by Bacon Happen is The Vanishing Dumpster Divers So this happened on the afternoon of March 13th, 2024. I woke up super late, not feeling well, and was running late to a meeting. Frazzled, I hurried out the door into the parking lot towards my car. I have to park a little ways down from my unit as there's limited parking. As I was walking to the car, I could see two people at the dumpster across the lot, about 15 yards from my parked car. They were dumpster diving, which is pretty common in my area and honestly doesn't bug me as long as they put the trash they don't take back in the dumpster. I hate litter bugs. Anyway, they looked like they had just got there, with one in the dumpster handing things out to the other one who was fluffing out an empty plastic bag to store their newly found treasures. I watched them out of curiosity as I rounded the front corner of my car to get to the driver's side door. While stepping off the curb, my crocs slipped on some mud, causing me to fall back. I grabbed the side of my car and was able to get my feet back under me. When I regained my composure, I looked back to the dumpster, half expecting to see at least one of them giggling at me for being so clumsy, and there was no one. The dumpster was closed and there was no one else in the lot. The exit to the lot is about 100 yards from the dumpster, so there's no way the one in the dumpster could have gotten out and closed it without me hearing. It slams loudly, let alone taking off out of sight in the two seconds I slipped and caught myself. I honestly began to question whether or not I had seen anyone at all, but I distinctly remember seeing them, with the one in the open dumpster rummaging and the other fluffing up the trash bag. And if there was no one else, I would have seen the mud and avoided slipping as I, being clumsy, tend to watch my footing especially in places where I know there will be mud. So then there had to have been people there I was distracted with originally. Did I slip, hit my head, and die in another universe and get transported to this universe where there weren't dumpster divers? I don't know, but I had to sit in my car for a few minutes to convince myself I wasn't losing it. So far, the lack of dumpster divers seems to be the only difference, but I'll let you know if that changes. I talked to my fiancé about the event and he is convinced the dumpster divers were guardian angels that helped me when I fell, as I'm clumsy and more than likely should have hurt myself. Whether it was a glitch or a guardian angel thing, I'm glad I didn't die. Case file number 1580, written by Austin Mermaid, The Gym Anomaly I've heard people jokingly comment, it must be a glitch in the Matrix. I always thought it was just a reference from the Matrix movie, until a few weeks ago when one happened to me. I hope I can explain this clearly. It involves some back and forth between a couple of lockers at my gym. It's a little confusing. There's a bank of small square lockers near the front door that can be used for a jacket or purse. Instead of going to the locker room and locking everything in a full size locker, it's convenient. So when it's cold out, I'll occasionally use it for my jacket and car keys. You set your own four digit combination, so you don't need to bring your own lock. There have been a few times when I locked my stuff up and forgot which one I used. It's a little embarrassing because then you have to go to get someone who works there, that has a key, to help you figure out where your stuff is. On the day this happened, I told myself that I wasn't going to forget which locker I used. So I picked the one on the very top right corner, let's call it locker number 6. It was locked, so I decided to use the one directly below it, let's call that one locker number 12. I put my jacket and keys in 12, locked it up and went to work out. After my workout, I came back, put my combination in number 12, opened the door and, what the hell? Someone else's stuff was in that locker that I had just unlocked with my own combination. It was a pink hoodie. I had worn a black fleece jacket and of course my keys were not in there either. 
I thought, okay, there's a slim chance that somebody else had chosen the exact same combination that I had chosen that day. Maybe I really did get number six and my stuff is really in there and I'm losing it. I don't know. So I tried it using my combination and I couldn't open it. Baffled, I went and got somebody from the front desk and told her what happened. She couldn't explain how someone else's stuff got into my locker, number 12, that I had just unlocked with my combination. She looked at me like I was a weirdo and said she would try and unlock the other ones around it to help me find my stuff. I told her to try number six because that's the one I was going to use originally but wasn't able to open it with my combination. She used the key to open it and there was my jacket and keys. I can usually come up with some kind of logical explanation even if it's far-fetched when weird things happen. I'm completely stumped on this one. Case file number 1581, written by Neon Gypsy, Frozen Time in a Mysterious Carnival. It was summer 2019 and I was with an ex who had three daughters. We decided to take them to a local fair and it was one of the last nights, so I was packed. He had taken his oldest with him to go on a ride that the two little ones couldn't get on. I had gotten them tickets and we walked around going on different rides for three or four year olds. I had one on each side of me and they were holding my hand. We had to walk around the fair to get to the one ride they wanted to go on again. When time seemed to slow down, it was probably only a few seconds, but it felt like a whole eternity. I remember all of a sudden, everything got real slow. There was no noise at all. I couldn't hear talking, the rides, nothing but my own heart. And everyone that I passed was staring at me. It's hard to explain, but all of a sudden, every single person I passed while walking suddenly just stared at me with a look of horror. I remember it feeling like they were all actors and for that brief moment, they were scared. I realized what was going on. I can't explain it properly, but I remember it felt like they knew me in some way. It wasn't just one or two people who were staring at me. It was every single person we passed stopped what they were doing and gawked at me. As if I was the center of everyone's attention, I remember it felt like things were coming to a head and then all of a sudden sound returned. People went back to being normal and time sped back up. I never have forgotten this and just was thinking about it this morning, wondering if anyone else ever experienced anything like this. I was not under the influence of anything. This is one of the many strange experiences I've had in my lifetime. Case file number 1582, written by Para Throwaway, from music into her necklace. I love reading stories about objects that mysteriously disappear and reappear. Then it happened to me. One weekend in February 2023, my daughter purchased a necklace that she fell in love with while we vacationed in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The next week, she called me one day in a panic while I was at work because she lost the pendant while she was getting ready in her bathroom. Her bathroom is very, very small and the floor is marble tile. She said that when she was putting on her necklace, the pendant dropped and she heard it hit the tile. She searched and searched but couldn't find it. I rolled my eyes thinking this was just her not looking hard enough. I got home and searched the tiny bathroom. I got on my hands and knees and looked under the cabinets and in any gaps in the baseboards. I finally had to give up. It wasn't there. Later that summer, we had an awesome but exhausting time at Lollapalooza. After the last day, we got up early and drove eight hours to return home. For some reason, my daughter had an urge to clean her room, which has never happened. At the time, we had a lady who would clean our home weekly. Well, my daughter noticed that her ceiling fan blades were dusty, so she got up on her bed and reached up to clean them. She screamed, Mom, guess what? Her necklace pendant was on the ceiling fan blade? I was shocked. She uses that fan every night. Of course, we put the pendant on the fan and turned it on to see what happened. As expected, the pendant flew off immediately. We have no idea how her pendant disappeared after she dropped it on the bathroom floor and reappeared months later on her ceiling fan. Case file number 1583, written by Rebel Without a Sauce, The Cursed Mirror. So, once when I was about 15 years old, I went down to a room in my parents' house with a book. The room somehow insulated against my half-deaf mother's television and the sounds of the city. The one unusual feature of this room was a mirror covering most of one of the walls in the room. It was made up of two foot sections since it was a very old mirror. It was the middle of the day, but I planned to be reading there for a while. So I walked toward the lamp to turn it on. I was reaching to turn on the lamp when I thought I saw something in the mirror. I looked over and saw my reflection in the mirror, along with that of a tall man, maybe a bit taller than me, but much thinner, standing beside me. Since I had not seen any man in the direction I was reaching into, I looked beside me. I was relieved to find nothing there. 
I was already thinking, wow, that was weird. Must have been some synapses misfiring. Then I looked back in the mirror. The man was still standing there beside me, even though there was nothing next to me. I stared back at him. He was tall blonde and wearing a black three-piece suit with a tie, and his eyes were looking into mine. I stood there for a few moments, just staring, trying to understand what I was seeing. He just stared, not like he was a frozen image, but as if he were just looking curiously at me. So after perhaps 20 seconds of bafflement, I took a step back, turned around and ran upstairs. I luckily was not alone and my mother was upstairs. I just started yelling in horror and tried to tell her about the man where there was no man. I am generally a calm person, even in danger, so instead of thinking the house was being broken into, she thought I had abruptly gone insane because she had never seen me display such fear or emotion. I could not be coerced to go in that room or even walk past the doorway for a month or two. I just used the side door always to avoid having to go near it. I would even come out of the side door to answer the doorbell. So a while later I went in there to see someone who was visiting. Nothing weird happened, although I kept looking at that large mirror waiting for something to happen. A few weeks later I went into the adjacent room to get something. I glanced over and saw something sitting on the rug in that room with the mirror. It is directly in the center of the room. I walked in and it looked like a piece of a fur coat. There was a falling apart fur coat in a nearby closet, so I picked it up. Dead squirrel? No wounds or apparent reason why it died or how it got in. I was a bit upset because I used to have several pet squirrels when I was younger. I have never had any hallucinations like this that I am aware of. I often wonder how it happened. To this day, many years later, I do not keep mirrors anywhere in the house except the bathroom. Case file number 1584, written by Ruby Red Apple One. The Delicious Mystery at Tacos El Gordo. Me and my husband are quite in shock after experiencing something really weird yesterday. Background. One year ago, March 2023, during our travels to Vegas, we went to a taco spot called Tacos El Gordo. There was a long line and while in line, the guy in back of us started making conversation. It was a very high spirited guy with braces that explained he was staying at a hotel nearby and had come the previous night with his wife and kids to get some tacos. They really liked the tacos so they had come back. He shared that they'd flown in from the PNW. A bit about his job and his wife. His wife and children eventually join him, hang out for a bit in line with him, then head back out to find a seat. These details matter later on in the story. We share a bit about ourselves and do some small talk. We finally get to the front of the line, order our food, and say our goodbyes and nice to meet you. That's it. Never see them again. Totally forgot about this incident. Present day, one year later, March 2024, we took a weekend trip to San Diego. We have never been there so we wanted to check it out. I want to add some context to this day because I think it's important to note all the things that had to happen and change for the event to have happened. First of all, out of all weekends, it decided to rain down in San Diego this weekend so we had to readjust our plans. We'd planned to do those trolley hop on hop off rides to the main sightseeing locations in San Diego. Unfortunately because it was raining so badly, the trolley decided to limit the number of shuttles that passed by, leaving us stranded in the first location we hopped off. We came up with plan B which was to make our way to museums in Balboa Park, to wait for the rain to stop and then head to a few other neighborhoods once we got some clear skies. Once we got through all that, we headed back towards the neighborhood we were staying at, tried out a bar but weren't really feeling the vibe, walked for a bit and finally decided to head to where the event occurred. The event. My husband suggested that we should go to a taco spot I'd pinned on Google called Tacos El Gordo. We weren't too hungry but we might as well taste it because it had great reviews. There's a huge line. And as we're waiting in line we realize that this is actually the same Tacos El Gordo as the one in Las Vegas we'd gone to the year before. Cool. Didn't know they had a chain. We started talking about how we'll compare which location was better. There is this couple in front of us and right in front of them we notice this guy that starts chatting them up. We overheard him making small talk, asking them what they did for a living, etc. I briefly caught a glimpse of this guy and mentioned it to my husband. Hey, doesn't that guy look like the guy we met in Las Vegas last year? That would be funny if it was him, wouldn't it? Then we stared more carefully. He doesn't have the braces anymore. But that definitely looks like him. We remember that he had his wife and kids. So we tell ourselves if we see them, then we know for sure it is him. 
One minute later, we see them. Holy crap, our faces go white and we're stunned. To triple confirm, my husband actually goes up to the guy and asks him, this might sound weird, but did you happen to go to Las Vegas last year and also went to Tacos El Gordo while there? The guy confirmed that he had been. He said his family flew in for a spring break this year to San Diego. We're walking around and happened to notice that this was the same taco spot they went to in Vegas, so they decided to stop at that moment. He actually did not remember our conversation in Vegas, but he kind of laughed and thought it was also a weird coincidence. We again made some small talk while in line, got our tacos, and went our separate ways. What the hell, this was just not a coincidence, this just doesn't happen ever. What is the probability that we'd both end up in the same city, one year later, at the same restaurant, same weekend, same time, only two feet away? Not to mention that our whole day wasn't supposed to go this way. It could have gone completely differently. And yet somehow, every single decision we made up to this moment led us to the same spot. We actually weren't even supposed to go to San Diego on this particular weekend. I'd originally booked it for two weeks prior, but realized we had plans, so rebooked everything all over again. How does this happen? To the kind stranger we met, see you next year in whatever city we decide to make a plan to in March. Case file number 1585, written by Lucky Landlord. The Ice Cube Beyond the Multiverse. Some background on who I am. Perfectly healthy 26-year-old male. I was fully awake, sober, you call it. What happened, step by step? I went to the kitchen. I took a glass for a drink. I poured a Pepsi inside it. Opened the freezer and took an ice cube from there. Put it inside my glass where the Pepsi was. Clearly saw that the ice cube was there in the Pepsi. I swear to God, my mind is clear. I never forget anything. If I put an ice cube there, I know it and remembered it. Then I felt like I had a one second blackout, maybe even less. The ice cube had disappeared. I know it's a super small thing, but I knew I put it there. My heart started racing since I was sure it was there. I looked at the ice cubes where I took it from. I used a plastic ice cube box to make them, and it was missing one ice cube, the one I took from it. I searched the whole kitchen, that maybe just maybe, I didn't put it inside the glass. It was nowhere to be found. I am 100% sure it was there inside the glass. I know it seems like such a small, not important thing. Like, oh, haha, maybe you just didn't put the ice cube there in the first place. But yes, I did. I am sure. Case file number 1586, written by Anonymous, facing the unthinkable. Last year, I was dating this really messed up guy. One of the many things that made up his personality was his hatred for all things Christian. I wasn't much of a believer in God myself, so that didn't bother me. One night, we were on the phone really late. I was laying in bed on my side when I got a very strong urge to roll over and look behind me. It felt like someone was standing there. Then I felt really tired, and I didn't remember anything until about an hour later when I woke up to my boyfriend crying. Not only was it strange for him to show any emotion, but he was praying too. I asked him what was going on and he proceeded to tell me that I had been possessed. Apparently in that hour when I thought I was asleep, my voice changed. He described it as taunting. He told me I kept teasing him and trying to say hurtful things, talking about myself as if I was someone else and growling. He told me I called him a C-word, which happens to be my least favorite word. Then he told me something that literally gave me goosebumps. He said that I said, I'm going to come see you every night. Does that bother you? The next day I told my very religious mom, and she insisted I go to someone who knows about these things. A few weeks later, I met with a woman who only made my fears worse. She had me close my eyes and tell her everything that popped in my head. There was a weird process that ended with me seeing whatever was in my room last night. That's when I realized I've seen it ever since I was a little girl. I used to always go to my parents' room in the middle of the night and it would always be standing in the shower. Also, I saw it in my backyard a few times. After the session with the professional, things just got worse. One night when everyone was asleep, I was going downstairs to get a drink and I saw it. My stairs opened up to my living room and as I was almost at the last step, I saw it. Not for a split second or out of the corner of my eye. I saw it as clearly as I would see anything else. Probably 30 seconds went by with us staring at each other before I fainted. When I woke up, it was gone. I haven't seen it since, but I think it's seen me. Case file number 1587, written by Mr. Zana 
the day the woods came alive. This one time around 2007, I was about 13 and in 8th grade or 7th. There is a park fairly close to our school, so me and my mates would walk over there after school hours to just chill. We did this until we graduated. My mother was a teacher at the school, so we all had rides home. Well, around the western side of the park were these dense woods. There was a walking trail around the park with a creek that crossed right through the middle, making bridges and into the dense wood-like area. We would look for crawfishes in that creek until one day, we decided that we were going to go find out where the creek ran from. So they decided to follow the creek back into the woods. Well, see, I had a new pair of Converse. I loved them and was not getting them torn up or messed up due to the water, so I stayed behind. I was waiting along the bank while they eventually faded into the woods. I leaned back and was watching the clouds when I heard a rustle from the woods. I thought nothing of it at the time because it was only a subtle sound. As I kept hearing it, I figured it must have been birds in the trees, but I realized it was unusually quiet. No birds were chirping. There was a highway nearby. I figured cars would have been going by, but there was nothing. No wind, birds, or cars, just me, my breathing, and rustling. So I look over to where the rustling was and saw nothing but the green of the trees in the dense area. There was a bush further back that for some reason stood out as it was unnaturally green. Keep in mind most of this area was only pine trees, so it was fairly dark green. I took a moment to really look at it and I swear as I was watching, the more I looked, the more I could make out a face and legs. Thinking this was just another one of those cases where you look at something like a cloud or ink plot and can make out faces out of it, I thought nothing of it and leaned back down to relax, because it was peacefully quiet. I couldn't get the thought out of my head though. It became to the point I felt being watched. I leaned over on my side to try and look at it from a different point of view, but still saw the face and hands. This next part freaks me out. In fact, typing this just sends shivers, but I can't help it. The thing stood up, turned around and walked further back into the woods. I was scared crapless. Afterwards, it felt like the world was on a jump start. Cars started going by, birds started up chirping, and the wind began to pick up a little more. My mates came back and were like, Dude, there's a rather big pond back there with some brim around it. It was cool. I couldn't say much. I was still stunned. They said they thought I'd seen a ghost. <laughs> the thing looked just like another piece of scenery until it literally got up and moved. It didn't phase into the trees. It turned around and walked. Just the way it walked back. That rustling sound was more ambient and made a thud whenever it stepped down. Freaking weird. Case Notes, file 1577. A surreal encounter in sunlight and silence. Don't know, so it's aliens. Could go on my tombstone. Or I could just adopt it as a life motto. <laughs> but I guess I would amend it to say, uh, don't know, so I hope it's aliens. Because often I don't actually think it is aliens even though I want it to be. But I really want it to be. <laughs> But to be able to mess with the human mind to this extent, who knows, maybe it really is aliens. I could see that. In this case, I don't think it's multiverse theory, you traveled to a different universe or saw it, because this one, it's just too different. The universe where you're in a playground and then you're just in a house with a person that knows you and that so told you to go back into the playground. No, there's no way. That would be really weird. That, that'd be like you're in the Matrix system itself in a different universe. No, no, it's not that. It feels more like a test than a glitch. It's like something was interfacing with your mind and knew that and it was deliberate. Also, the Three Body Problem on Netflix, a new show, it's quite the watch and I think it tethers a bit into this where I don't want to spoil anything. I'll just say that in short, can we be certain that we can trust our own senses? That nothing is able to mess with the synapses firing in our brain in a certain way to produce a specific pattern that we see. That's a question. Hmm. Makes you wonder, maybe all the glitches we're experiencing are deliberate to make us think that the universe is unstable when it's not. Probably I don't really think that, but it is an interesting idea. Hmm. Extremely terrifying, <laughs> but interesting. Case Alcifal, 1578. The car that merged from thin air. Stories like this one remind me how often life seems to be like a D&D &D campaign, Dungeons and Dragons. The core difference is we're not aware we're playing, and we don't know who the dungeon master is. What if it's our friends in the real world? I keep thinking lately, what if at the last life we have, after exhausting all quantum immortality copies, then we finally die for real, but we just reawaken, 
Open up the pod, the VR pod, in the real world, and our friends are there in that real world, and our memories return or just weren't suppressed because we're conscious in that real world. It literally is just the Matrix, with the exception that there aren't killer robots that control us and have us in pods. No, it's just our friends, and our maybe all of our lives are taking place in the blink of an eye, a summer afternoon. And then we just open the pod, we die first, open the pod, then go back to work or something. <laughs> go back to our wife and kids there. What is so cool is this thought is not at all impossible. In fact, it's kind of likely. And if true, then our experiences here, our challenges, they matter. They were intended for us. Partly by us, we wanted to experience something challenging. And by the dungeon master, our friends or maybe a employee that works in the company that's hosting these advanced VR pods. So we go there, we sign up because we wanted a new experience. Something novel. Where there isn't any real risk, we just don't know because that memory of reality is suppressed. Now, of course, this could all be wrong. Maybe this is just the only reality. <laughs> But damn, it's fun to think about. But specific to this glitch of a car that just appears from nowhere but then vanishes again, that's the key. I don't think it's multiverse sight because you both acted like you were physically there. It wasn't just some ethereal sight of a soul. No, the whole car was there for the both of you. This other mystery car reacted directly to you and your presence, both in line of sight and both fully materialized. There's of course space-time portals which are so common when driving. But that doesn't really fit. Even if the portal was a while away, so this mystery car took it, then appeared right, in, right next to you, in the moment you went to merge lanes, okay, that is plausible, but then how did it vanish? Because then you were in the same lane, neither merged, and then he vanished. Then you were still in the same vector direction, you would have crossed the space-time portal first. So you would be the one to vanish, not the other car. If there were two portals that were in such close proximity. So I don't think it could be that either. This one is quite hard to place. Now time for the quote of the day. If knowledge can create problems, it is not through ignorance that we can solve them. Isaac Asimov. It's a funny circle of life where we have problems, so we delve deep into our minds and analyze reality to determine a course of action that is predictable to solve the problem. The only problem is, by analyzing the universe, we discover new mysteries and new problems. So we keep digging to solve those problems, and then we create a hundred new ones, and then we have to keep digging to solve those ones. And I don't know if there's an end to this. It may go on for infinity, which is exciting, but it really does make you wonder, is there a limit to the mysteries of the universe? It's fun to be along the ride with you to discover what we can. Que sont 1579. The Vanishing Dumpster Divers. I like where your fiancé's head was going. Guardian angels are a pretty good idea, but I don't think they really fit in this case. When guardian angels inhabit a real material person, they still obey the laws of physics to a certain extent. For instance, if they had super speed and they zipped over to you in the fraction of a second it would take to save your life from, you know, banging your head on the door, that level of speed would create a sonic boom and the g-forces would have ripped the body apart. So the guardian angel may have survived in the spirit form, but the body would have been destroyed. And I don't think guardian angels are supposed to do that. And of course, you would have experienced it, the sonic boom most notably, in the completely eviscerated body. <laughs> I think your original thought that it was quantum immortality, not knowing the word, just a different universe, you probably did die from slipping, banging your head, and now you're in a new universe. And in this one, those dumpster divers weren't here. They may have been in a different dumpster, just a block away. And of course, just look out for other differences in your universe. If you find more anomalies, you'll know that your soul went for a hop and a skip. Case notes are file 1580. The Gym Anomaly. Is this also a case of quantum immortality? People do sadly die in the gym a bit more frequently than in the general populace because you're straining so extremely hard in the gym. It's not that surprising. Blood pressure spikes, cardiovascular activity increases, the heart rate skyrockets. Now, these are good things in general, but if you have an ailment, then doing these kinds of strenuous physical activities can cause it to burst in that singular moment. But it wouldn't explain everything, because you had the combination to the locker that wasn't yours in the new universe. But why would the, that combination match? It makes sense that you didn't know the combination for the locker that was yours in the new universe, but why would you know the one that wasn't yours? Why would it be the same? Because it was a different person that set it up for locker number 12. Hmm. But it is technically possible 
that it was just a coincidence. In this new universe, the person that did take locker 12 had the same combination as yours. I think it's probably four digits. I don't know if you mentioned how many digits it was. If it's four digits, then I think it's like 10,000 possible combination differences. So that's a lot, but it's not so much that it is completely out of the realm of possibility. And now time for the joke of the day. I excel at sleeping. In fact, I can do it with my eyes closed. Que sont 1581. Frozen time in a mysterious carnival. This brings me back to a story over a year ago, maybe two years ago, year and a half, something like that. There was this man that was in a restaurant. I think he was proposing to his wife, but maybe not. I know he was in a restaurant, 100%. And time just slowed down. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Everything else around him slowed down. His partner, I know he was with someone else, and the waiters, the waitresses, the other patrons, everyone slowed down very, very slowly. The key difference in this story, though, is all the people that were looking at you in terror, like you didn't belong. It was like you're seeing behind the curtains in a way that you were not supposed to. And damn, is that freaking eerie. <laughs> Those, there's stories like this where you just like feel it in the pit of your stomach Ooh, <laughs> not right. Something's not right. Case notes are file 1582. From music into her necklace. I think we're all in that camp that we love DOP stories. It's the most classic glitch style that exists, in my opinion. Just common, but still very interesting. It's the bread and butter of glitch in the Matrix stories. For a good reason. <laughs> You can fill up on it, and it's quite tasty. <laughs> you don't have to go to these exotic dishes like time freezes or space-time portals or aliens. Stuff like that is uh, more extreme, you know, caviar and uh, other dishes that maybe you don't have to have, although they have their place. <laughs> but the bread and butter goes to another level when the item returns to you. And especially in the case where it returns to you in a place that is impossible that it could have been even a day prior because you always use the fan. And as you tested, if you use a the fan, then the centrifugal force pushes the necklace away. So if it was there, it would have fallen off. So it literally just was placed there within a day. Who did it? Maybe we'll never know. Maybe it's just the universe being funny. Or the dungeon master of your campaign. <laughs> Case notes of file 1583. The Cursed Mirror. A person from a long time ago. As you mentioned, the mirrors were very old. As is a soul that is trapped or infused into that mirror. But cursed object, I don't think is quite right. It doesn't really express what we mean. Because it's like in fiction where you have a cursed object, you touch it and your hand turns black or you die. Or stuff like that. It's not really that way. Cursed object, in this case, just means a object that has a soul infused to it. And that soul is a negative energy. Nothing happens if you touch the object. But if you're around it, then there can be negative effects, let's say. Because the soul is unpleasant to be around. So the soul can bring misfortune just from being near it, if it's a negative spirit in this case. Malicious indeed. A dead squirrel in the room is very morbid. But the more disconcerting aspect to this is, how did the spirit know that you had pet squirrels in the past? Can spirits read our minds or our memories? Boy, is that a disturbing thought. To lighten the mood, now time for the joke of the day. What happened to the archaeologist who lost her job? Her career was in ruins. <laughs> yeah, I guess she's still there. I mean, doesn't matter if you lost your job or not. It's your passion, so keep exploring those ruins. <laughs> Dig away. Get that, that little brush that moves sand away from artifacts delicately. Those are neat to use. <laughs> Case notes are file 1584. The delicious mystery at Tacos El Gordo. Coincidences permeate through every single facet of our lives, every single day. Something miraculous and incredibly unlikely happens. We just don't notice most of them, because they don't directly impact us. Or if they do, we just don't appreciate the sheer odds of it. Indeed, just being born is a tremendous luck of happenstance. Why was your sperm exactly the one that managed to reach the egg, right? Out of millions or billions. But of the coincidences that do impact us, are they all planned out by some external force? Some grand cosmic web that has every single possibility mapped out, and your exact path through that web mapped out as well? Well, I personally don't think so. I'm not a fate kind of guy. But influenced, yes. 
Guardian Angels, Angels, Aliens, CIA, Government, <laughs> the Dungeon Masters of the Simulation, whatever you want to call it, there are so many possible influences of a higher level that could be trying to manipulate where we end up. I do believe that is true. I just don't believe they have perfect control over the future. There's no way to know who has a hand in tossing proverbial pebbles on our road, and we may never know to just what extent our lives are influenced. Okay, Salzifal, 1585. The Ice Cube, Beyond the Multiverse. So that Ice Cube tray actually pushes away quantum immortality as a viable explanation, because why would there be a cube missing in the tray of the new universe if you never used one? I mean, maybe you used one earlier in that day? But that seems a bit of a stretch. I guess it's not impossible. But that momentary blackout, where things just go black for half a second a second, that reminds me of when people describe the sun blinking out of existence, but it's only for half a second to a second in those cases as well. And it's only for a small geographic area, so it doesn't affect the entire planet. What this makes me think is, this isn't quantum immortality. It's another demonstration of server cluster failure. That's what is actually happening when people see the sun going out. It gives tremendous credence to the idea that we live in a simulation. And in that real world, there are still computers of a certain type and server clusters like we use here. If you're playing a MMORPG online or any service online, there's various server clusters that are charged with handling the logic of the program and also the traffic to the server. And if one of those clusters crashes, well, there's others in a cloud, so to speak, that will take over. But that process still takes some time. Even though it's very fast, it's not so fast that it's instantaneous to our perception. We perceive it as sound and light going out for half a second to a second in a geographic area. How big is a server cluster managing in terms of the virtual real world that we inhabit here? A square mile? 10 square miles? Who knows? But in that volume of area, anyone within it will perceive light and sound just vanishing, even if they're indoors. It's not the sun, it's any sort of input coming in. And really, when you think about it, this is as classic a glitch as a glitch can be. It's literally just an error in the server managing the simulation. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now time for the quote of the day. If the human mind was simple enough to understand, we'd be too simple to understand it. Emerson Pug. Well, when you appreciate just how powerful the human mind is, and how there's 8 billion of them walking around, that's amazing. There's 8 billion computers out there trying to understand the nature of reality. Our minds are not easy to understand, because they're so complex. But if they were simpler, they wouldn't have the processing power to understand that simplicity either. So I think there's a tipping point where you're complex enough eventually to understand yourself, your own makeup. It's like the test for animals. Can they perceive themselves in a mirror? It's the mirror test. I think dolphins and elephants do pass, but chickens, dogs generally don't, cats don't. They just think it's another reality that they can't access. Not themselves. I think pigs can pass the test as well. Pigs are actually quite smart. But anyways, I think suffice to say, appreciate the gift you have, your own mind, and the ability to perceive reality, whatever it might ultimately be deep down. Case notes for file 1586, Facing the Unthinkable. So in a sense, facing your demons is something that every person eventually has to come to terms with. But facing them in a literal sense of demonic possession? <laughs> that's another level entirely. And I'm trying to contemplate how I would personally react in a situation like this, where you black out for an hour, you think you just fainted or went to bed, but no, in reality you were possessed for that entire hour. You like to think that you're pure or strong, and you could resist that kind of possession, whatever it might be. Maybe you can't. I mean, you won't know until it happens to you, if it ever does, and I hope it never does happen to any of us, for sure. But it's natural to want to believe that you'd be strong enough to resist that. Maybe most people wouldn't, and it's not really their fault. How would you react after the fact, especially if the demon possessing you did something horrific? What about all the people in prison for murder or something like that? Are there a lot of people in there that shouldn't be because it wasn't really them, they were possessed? Well, I guess it's hard to say because if that did happen to you, would you go around telling people, telling the court and the judges and the lawyers that, no, I was just possessed? Well, maybe if you're trying to cop a uh, insanity plea, but <laughs> if it really did happen, at least to your perception, I don't know. Maybe if someone took a video of you crawling on the ceiling, you know, that would 
give some credence, but I don't think we have any of those videos going around that are legitimate. Although then you have to ask, was a demonic possession purely limited to an hour, or was your soul able to eventually reject it? Maybe initially it couldn't, but after an hour or so, it was able to push it out. So that's a half and half answer. You couldn't fully reject it, but you did eventually. Or is there just a limit to how long a demon can possess us for? Okay, Saint Sefau, 1587. The day the woods came alive. When reality is described as being muted, the sounds and visuals of the world are dampened, that is, I think, when you know that you're in a dead pocket server. That and also no other human beings around, or any animal life at all. Even the wind is slowed down. Now in these dead pocket servers, I think at any given time, there's maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people in totality. If everyone that dies goes to the same buffer world, so to speak, maybe there's different ones. But if there's just a singular one where everyone goes, then in the entire scope of the planet, there's a few hundred to a thousand people. So that is nothing. You'll never meet someone, almost certainly never meet someone else. But maybe you will. Maybe this was another person trapped, and maybe you perceive them almost as blending into the environment. The other possibility is this was some sort of game master in charge of facilitating the transfer, observing you, making sure nothing bad happens to you along the process. Because maybe if you die there in the pocket universe, your own data is corrupted or something along those lines. This is total speculation, but it's, I guess it kind of fits. And now time for the quote of the day. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part to us, do they? George Carlin, the thing we declare war on, or the thing we say we're fighting for, is typically what we're fighting against. <laughs> Branding is so important for the normal person. It's the same thing as the Patriot Act for bills passed in the US or most places. To fool the public, they need a proper sounding title and total destruction of your right to privacy and due process is not a very good catchy sounding title, is it? But Patriot Act, now that sure is. So always be wary of the title of anything you're reading. If it's fiction, if it's an article, if it's a bill in Congress, if it's what a group calls themselves, always dig deeper beneath the surface because that's where the truth is. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony signing off.